Why is it that people who believe in God, believe he is a healer, believe he answers prayer, why is it that people who believe such things have difficulty in praying? Because people do have difficulty in praying. You would think in a way that something as simple as prayer would be easy. As a discipline, as a part of one's life, it really isn't. If you can, you can take heart if you have difficulty because you are emphatically not alone. I had a letter from a lady this past week whose husband is suffering from cancer. She had just learned about a diagnosis of very severe cancer, and he had been put into the hospital for it. And her letter to me was, Mr. Dart, I, I just can't pray. For the first time in my life, I find myself unable to pray. And I thought a lot about that, and, and I, I know that there have been times in my life when I've had times when I've been up and times when I've been down and times when prayer seems to come easy and times when prayer doesn't come easy at all. And I wonder, there is something, I think, in man that makes it hard to pray, but what is it? Why should anyone have difficulty in praying? Is it because we think that God will not hear us? That's a possibility. I've heard people speak of getting on their knees to pray and having the feeling that their prayers were bouncing off the ceiling, going no higher than the ceiling, that nobody was hearing it but them, that it was just rattling around in the room and wasn't going anywhere at all. I've heard them describe it that way. They don't think God actually is hearing what they are saying. And there could be any number of reasons why a person might feel that way. They may feel that way because they feel unworthy. They may feel that way because they feel that God is down on them. They may feel that God has somehow shut them up and won't listen to them. Uh, they may not have a very strong belief in God in the first place. There are any number of reasons why people may think that God doesn't hear them. Is it because we don't think it will change anything? And if that's the case, is it because we just don't believe? Uh, or do we believe that God is going to do what he's going to do regardless of what we ask? You know, what's the point in praying about this? I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to do this, but God already knows what's best. And he's going to do what's best, and I'm going to say thy will be done. And what's the point in asking beyond, you know, dear Father in heaven, thy will be done, amen, and going on because his will is going to be done anyway. I think maybe we don't pray a lot because we think it isn't going to change anything. God will just do what he's going to do, going to do whether we ask him to do it or not. Is it because of pride? Is it because, you know, there are people who just can't bring themselves to ask for anything. You know, it's, it's lowering yourself to ask for anything from another man or from another woman. And that character trait sometimes within us, that pride, can I think sometimes get carried over to where we're too proud to ask God for something that we want. Is it because we don't think the things that we're praying about are important enough? And we just don't want to bother God with our trivial little problems. He's all concerned with, with the whole world and with wars and, and rumors of wars and all these things. And there's no point in asking God to be concerned about this little problem of mine, the fact that my garden's drying up because it's not raining. Is it laziness? Is it because we just are too lazy to pray? But, you know, when you get down to that, you have to then ask the question, well, then how hard is prayer? You know, I can see laziness causing you not to weed your garden because that involves work. But prayer? Simply going to God in prayer, bowing your head over your meal or or going to a private place and getting on your knees and opening your Bible and praying to God? Is this hard? Is it laziness that prevents us from prayer? Is it shame? Is it we're just ashamed to ask, or we're ashamed of ourselves, or, or does shame somehow play a role in it? Is it because we don't have time? I don't have time to pray. i got to get shaved, showered. i got to get on the road. I'm going to be late to work. I don't have time. Uh, I've got to get this done. I've got my homework I've got to do. I've got my preparation I've got to do. This has got to be done. If I don't get this done by a certain time, is it the pressures of time that make it hard for us to pray? I dare say that one of the primary reasons why prayer is postponed, at least, and it's oftentimes continually postponed, is because of time, at least ostensibly. At least that's the, the way we express ourselves or that's the way we excuse ourselves, whatever the case may be. Is it, is it the cares of this world? Is it the pressures of life? Is it just so much stuff going on around us that we, you know, you can get to the place to where you have so much going on in your life that you become confused and disoriented 
and have trouble deciding what to do next. And sometimes you do next what has to be done and that can just go on. And since prayer doesn't have to be done, then prayer can get shoved off to another time. Is it because we find prayer boring? Now that can only be true if we find prayer ineffectual. Because no way that if you thought I was going to get on my knees and ask God for something, he was going to do it, no way you'd find that boring. That would be exciting. So if you find prayer boring, it can only be because you think it's ineffectual, I think. Or is it perhaps, is it perhaps the work of the devil, the temptations of the devil, the way the devil gets into our lives and begins to tempt us, draw us away, or turn us against prayer, or turn us away from prayer, or turn our hearts away from prayer, because he does tempt us. All the hows and the whys of how he tempts us, uh, you know, those aren't entirely well known to us. He seems to be able to put thoughts in our mind from time to time. He seems to be able to influence our moods or our behavior from time to time. So it should be no surprise if the devil himself actually could be a factor in why people don't pray, or why they put off prayer, or why they don't feel like praying, or really much want to pray on a given occasion. Now, the chances are it is the problem is some or all of the above things that I have mentioned, and it probably varies from person to person, and it may vary from day to day as depending upon what particular problem you may face. But at the same time, even though the particulars of it may change, there is one constant. You don't pray. Prayer isn't in your life. Or prayer, if it's there, is a toss-away, throw-away, quickie, let's get this out of the way so we can get on with something else type of thing. So all these things may do. It's a vast field of inquiry. Today, I want to make a start in inquiring as to the reasons why people don't pray or don't want to pray or even have an antipathy to prayer. The first scripture I want to take you to is Matthew 13 and verse 18. The, the, this first chapter of Matthew, the very first part of Matthew 13, begins with the parable of the sower and the seed. And you're very familiar with it, I think, by now, because this audience is, is a Bible-reading audience. And you know how the sower went forth to sow his seed, and some fell on good ground, and some fell on hard ground, and some fell on stony ground. Jesus tells the parable, and he goes on away, and his disciples come to him and say, Why are you speaking? Why do you speak to the crowd in parables? And he said, Because it's given to you to understand, it's not given to them to understand. But now... Hear the explanation of the parable of the sower and the seed. Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. In his heart. This is he that received seed by the wayside. But he, he that received the seed into stony places, he's that's the same as he that hears the word, and anon with joy receives it. But he has no root in himself. He endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, then by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So what do we got? We got the devil snatching stuff away from us from time to time. He has tribulation or persecution coming along as a problem. Then the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Now, what is significant to me about this is that the way that he, that he puts this to these people, he says it's the word that is sown in a person's heart. And it is the devil that catches this away. Or it is the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches that choke it. Now, what I'm coming, but coming to, to see in this, my, from my own perspective, is that the Word is crucial to prayer. That if the Word of God is not in your heart and in your mind, if those words that are spoken, the testimony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the words of Jesus, the words of God as spoken from Mount Sinai, the, the law of God, if these are not in your heart, prayer is going to be very difficult for you this many years ago at, 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 a, at a very personal level, that when I was trying to do some, some serious writing, that I found that I could write for a while and then I went dry. There was nothing more to write about. I had to go back to the library and I had to get down the books 
and I had to begin to read, and I had to do a lot of reading, and I found that as I read, ideas began to come, thoughts began to flow, and I could go back and I could write again. And I think one of the primary reasons why we find it difficult to pray is because we have not sown the word of God in our hearts deeply. We have not, you know, given ourselves to the study of it. We do not have a systematic approach to the study of it. And therefore, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the devil, all these things can prevent the word of God from being fruitful in our lives and in our hearts. This may be the simplest answer to the question that we have raised of all. And I'd have to tell you that while I have no way of evaluating the impact of Satan catching God's word away from us, I honestly believe that apart from that, for those of us living in the modern world, the cares of this world are the number one influence that prevents us from study, from prayer, from drawing close to God, from having spiritual things be important in our lives. It is the cares of this world. If you can just imprint that in your mind, if you can just remember it when you get up in the morning, if you can remember it at noon, if you can remember it at night, that this world will do everything in its power to crowd out the important things, the truly important things in your life. What could be more important than being able to talk to the God of the entire universe and be heard and have him respond. What could be more important than that? And yet, it is so easy for us to find things that are more important than that to us at the moment. I think that's fair. And I'm, you know, I, I will preach to myself as much as anybody. I'm not talking down to you in this regard. I firmly believe that this is a big factor in our lives, that we are just we just let this world, which is becoming more complicated by the minute, crowd out the important things in our lives. And if we don't get hold of it, if we don't make a conscious decision, if we don't grab it by the ears and make it go where we want it to go, it's going to eat us up. And when the end of it all, we will find we have no time left for what is really important, and that's our relationship with God. Now, as I studied on this subject, and digested that, another scripture came to mind. It's found back in the fifth chapter of James. In James, James writes and says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That's easily said. I got an affliction, I'll go pray about it. And I've often pondered the fact that some, so many of us find that our prayer life is generally enriched by a lot of trouble. In other words, whenever things start really going bad, Whenever our life, not just somebody else's life that's close to us, but our own life begins to go bad, when we're afraid, we're hanging upside down in a well somewhere by a rope, you know, there's where our, your prayer life suddenly becomes very active and very intense, right? Well, he says, is any among you, is he afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I mean, that's right there staring at us off the page. It says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Who's faith? Well, certainly the person who comes to pray for you must be a person of faith. I'm going to tell you something, though. In my experience as a minister over some nearly 40 years now, I have oftentimes found the response, the way in which the prayer works and the way in which the person's body responds in terms of healing or not, seems to have more to do with them than it does with me. And I don't know why that is. But I will tell you that there are times when I go to pray for someone where I am touched by that person's infirmity, I am moved by what they're going through, there is something between us at that moment. And oftentimes I remember one particular occasion where a woman was so, uh, she had injured her back, and she could not lift anything above more than you know, the weight of a paper, and she had a newborn baby, and she could not hold the baby in her arms to nurse the child. And she could not lift her arms any higher than this. It was just one of those things. And I, I remember being so touched by the situation and by her desire and her tears and so forth, prayed very fervently for her. And when I said amen and she stood up, she had this kind of expectant look on her face, and she took and she raised her arms straight up. It's one of the really remarkable occasions in my life where some of the healing has taken place immediately under my hands. I think a lot of people have been healed in times gone by. When you pray for them, they go away, 
They get 100 miles down the road and they're healed. They never hear about it. I can't tell you about those. But there have been, you know, just very few where the person has been healed actually under my hands. And these are incredible. When they take place, they, they, they send chills over your body to realize that this takes place. And one wonders, you know, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. But it's a two-sided thing on this faith. And I'm going to come back to this before I'm through. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's something that I think in our church we do pretty well. That we hear the prayer requests, we pray for one another that we may be healed. But listen to what he says when he goes on. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, I can, I can play a lot of games. I can, I can go back to my Strong's Concordance and dig up all kinds of words and chase things down. But boy, that leaps off the page at you. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, I looked this up, and I, I was really struck by something that surprised me. The words effectual and fervent here are actually only one word in the Greek, and the Greek word is energeo, from which we get the word energy. It's talking about the energized prayer, the fervent prayer of a energetic prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, the idea of an energetic prayer is, is kind of strange, isn't it? What's an energetic prayer? Well, I can imagine one. And that's Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane praying with so much earnest that he was sweating and the sweat was like great drops of blood off his brow. I'd call that an energetic prayer. Would you not? What he's talking about here is heartfelt, into it, energetic, involved prayer actually avails. It actually causes things to happen that would not happen without them. And I wonder, what's one of the reasons why we have difficulty in prayer because we do not believe that? Or is it because we can't muster up the belief in it? We can't muster up the faith in it. We can't feel it somehow. We can't, can't grapple with it because this is something, you know, James was clear on it, wasn't he? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man is going to change stuff out there. Then he gives us a concrete example. You see, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now, I would have thought that Elijah was told to do that. But that isn't necessarily so. That isn't necessarily so. And I, you know, the point is going to become, I think, a little clearer as we go on. Just suppose for a moment that Elijah... So impassioned by what he saw in this land, so furious with what he saw in the conduct of Ahab and Jezebel, with the way things were going, that he stood up and said, As God the Lord lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And walked out the door and left and disappeared for three and a half years. And it didn't rain. Did God tell him to do that? The implications of James is that Elijah... Did it? Kind of spooky to think about, isn't it? And the earth, and then he prayed again, and the earth gave, heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, understand this. If any of you do err from the truth, and somebody turns him around, let him know that he that converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. I think when you understand that, that the energetic prayer of the righteous man gets results, we may have raised another reason why we find prayer difficult. Is it because we are timid? We're just timid. There's a chapter in Brad Young's book, Jesus the Jewish Theologian, titled Faith as Chutzpah. Chutzpah is a little hard to define, just like it's hard to pronounce. Uh, but it means roughly headstrong persistence, brazen impudence, unyielding tenacity, bold determination. Chutzpah. I think that we are afraid to approach God with real faith. I think we just are afraid to do it. We're afraid to stick our neck out. We're afraid to take a chance on it. 
Now, Jesus gives us two parables. Brad Young mentions both of these. And Jesus gives these to make his point relative to believing, faithful prayer. I wouldn't go so far as to substitute the word chutzpah for faith, but there is a very close relationship between those two words. Luke 11, verse 1. It came to pass that he was just praying in a certain place. Jesus stopped, and when he got through, his disciples came and said, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say. Now, everybody in here, without even reading your Bible, could cite, I think, what Jesus said about how you are to pray. And he goes on down, and he says, give us our daily bread, forgive us our sins. He gives them the whole Lord's Prayer. And then he continues. He's not through teaching them how to pray. Are you, are you clear on this? The Lord's Prayer is not all he said in response to the question, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from the inside shall answer and say, don't bother me. The door is shut. <clears throat> My children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, as Young points out in his book, Jesus' listeners would have considered the response of the man who was in bed absolutely unconscionable. They would have had no sympathy for him whatsoever because he is violating a fundamental rule of Middle Eastern hospitality. The man who came to this friend of his on a journey was not merely the, the guest of his friend, he was the guest of the community. And the community had a responsibility to, be, to take care and to be hospitable to this man. So consequently, the responsibility, and the whole crowd would have seen it this way, of the man who was in bed was to get up out of bed and give his friend what he asked for out of hospitality. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. So they would have all thought, what a terrible person he is. But I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will arise and give him as much as he needs. What's going on here? Well, the man's not going to go away. He's going to stay down there. And he's going to keep on knocking on the door. He's going to say, get up and give me some bread. I'm not going to let you sleep until you get up and come out here and give me three loaves of bread. I've got company in the house. He said he may not do it because he's his friend, but he will do it to get rid of him. The word for importunity in the Greek literally means shameless. Shameless. Without shame. I think that's absolutely fascinating. Because a modest person would say, I ask, he rebuked me, and I, well, I guess I better go away. I, I guess I should go on home now because I must be causing him a lot of inconvenience on this occasion. No, he is shameless. You know, I think one of the reasons why God created the affinity between man and dog is because a dog is the perfect illustration of shamelessness in asking for what they want. They are, I can tell who the dog owners are in here. They are absolutely shameless. They don't care. And they don't care if you're a visitor in the house. They are still shameless. It's absolutely your obligation as a visitor in the home to pet this dog. You know, you're not allowed to just sit there and ignore the dog and pretend the dog isn't there, and the dog won't allow you to do it. And I ask myself the question, I've had this in my earlier list, is it possible that shame keeps us from praying in faith. In other words, we are not shameless enough. We're not like the dog who will, as long as it required, will keep whacking the door until you let him in. Though you're not like the dog who will come up to your elbow and, and put his nose on your elbow and whip your elbow up because you're ignoring him. And they'll do it, and they'll do it, until finally, you may not even realize you did it. You will go over and pet the dog. I get up and let my dog in and out of the door without even knowing I did it. I'm on autopilot. I am an automatic door opener for my dog. Allie comes in and says, is she in or out? I don't know which way she went last. <laughs> Why does this work? It works because the dogs don't give up. And they are shameless. And I really think that what Jesus is trying to tell us when he speaks of his, his shamelessness is that what he expects us to do is to be shameless in our approach to God, to be bold in our approach to God, to, be, to not hesitate to keep on asking and ask again, and to be firm in what we ask for. I say unto you, he said, continuing in verse 9, 
Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. And just keep on knocking. For everyone that asks receives. He that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. One thing you can say for sure, can't you? The person that doesn't ask is not going to get it. The person that isn't looking for it isn't going to find it. And the person that doesn't knock on the door is never going to get it open. Right? Can we, can we conclude that fairly? If you don't go looking for it, you're not going to find it. You don't knock on the door, nobody's going to open it. And so if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. These things I think we all understand clear as crystal. And here's Jesus saying, okay, ask, knock, look for it. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, is he going to give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, is he going to give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, is he going to offer him a scorpion? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I don't know, you've heard this parable before, probably read it a hundred times, but you need to understand the, the, the point that is being made here is not that God is a, a bad neighbor. The point is that God, you know, if you expect to be, be heard of God, you're going to have to knock and you're going to have to be persistent in what you do, and you're going to have to be shameless. Then comes the parable in Luke 18 and verse 1. Luke 18, verse 1. He spoke a parable unto them unto this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge who did not fear God and didn't regard man. This guy is fearless. He is tough judge. He is the main man. Nobody troubles this guy except for this widow. There was a widow in the city, and she came to him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he wouldn't. Just wouldn't do it. In fact, he wouldn't do it for a while. I don't know how long this went on. But finally, he said within himself, I don't fear God, I'm not afraid of God, and I don't have any regard for man. But this widow is getting to be a pain in the neck. And I'm going to avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, here, the Lord, and the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry to him the day and night, though he bear long with you? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes, is he going to find any faith on the earth? Faith. You might, if you ask this question, when, it, when the Son of Man comes, is he going to find any bold persistence? Is he going to find any aggressive seeking? Is he going to find people who are, who are really persistent and bold and even impudent? Throughout the Talmud, as a matter of fact, the word chutzpah is translated impudent, which seems like, how can, I be, how can I be impudent to God? Well, there was a man in the second temple period they called Choni the circle drawer. He was asked to pray for rain, and he prayed for rain for some time, and no rain came. So he decided that more audacious action was called for. He drew a circle on the ground, stepped inside the circle, and declared that he was not going to leave that circle until it rained. He was criticized by some of the religious leaders of the time for doing this. He thought that was totally inappropriate and impudent of him toward God to tell God he had to rain. He was going to say, I'm going to stay right here in this circle, God, until you send us some rain. But it rained. It rained. That's good spot. To tell God, I'm staying in this circle until it rains. Was he right? Was he wrong? Well, consider Moses as an illustration from the Bible. This guy is a Jewish rabbi in the first century. Let's consider Moses. Exodus 32, verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this, this people, and I behold, look, they are a stiff-necked people. Now let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and they may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now I don't know how you look at this. I don't know how some people look at this. There's a, some people think that, that, that the whole timeline of history is already laid out and written, that God knew what Moses was going to do and knew what he was going to do when all was said and done. I find that very difficult because that puts God in the position of running a bluff on Moses. And I don't believe God ever bluffs. I think when he said, let me alone, he meant what he said. When he said, I will make of you a great nation, I'll start this whole thing over again with you. That guy. I can do that. Does it, do any of us have any question that God could have done that? 
that he could have wiped out the whole nation of Israel at the foot of that mountain, that he could have started all over again with a plan with Moses in the place of Abraham and run the whole thing again? Anybody have any doubt that he could have done that? I don't. He could have done it. And he said right here, I'm going to do it. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your anger wax, wax hot against your people, which you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the, the Egyptians speak and say, well, he took them out there for mischief, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them on the face of the earth. Now listen to what he says. Turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Now, which one of you people has the nerve to speak in the imperative mood to God? You know what the imperative mood is. That's what we use when we give commands. It's what we mean, use when we tell the dog, sit. That's the imperative mood. Moses said, turn, repent. I mean, which one of you is bold enough to call upon God to repent? That's chutzpah. It's faith. It's the bold persistence. It's the nerve that sometimes is needed to be able to go to God and to stand up and be counted. Well, remember Isaac. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your seed like the stars of heaven. I'll give this land to them and they shall inherit it forever. And guess what? The Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. This was not a get. I mean, this was not a threat. It was no idle gesture on God's part. He actually thought to do it. And Moses persuaded him not to do it. And I wonder how many of us are alive today because he did. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. I'm sorry, I have a wrong scripture here. I don't want Hebrews 10, verse 9. I want Luke 7, verse 37. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. When the Pharisee that had invited him saw that, he said, This man, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that is touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I've got something to say to you. He said, Master, say on. He said, there was a certain creditor that had two debtors. One owed 500 pence, the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, which one of them is going to love him the most? And Simon said, I suppose he to whom he forgave the most. And he said to him, you judged right. And he turned to the woman and he looked at her and he said, Simon, see this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which was the most fundamental basic element of Middle Eastern hospitality. The guest comes to the house, you give them water to wash their feet. He didn't do that. You didn't give me water for my feet. She has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but since I got in here, this woman hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. This woman anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Wow. You know, this is really a, a heavy thing. And the people sitting at the dinner said, Whoa, wait, who is this that forgives sins? And he said to the women, listen to what he said to this woman. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I have heard more dancing around this expression than you can ever imagine because of the implications of it. Because if you understand, it's not supposed to be our faith that has anything to do with this. It's supposed to be the faith of God. You know. But notice what he said. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Think about it. Just substitute the word chutzpah. How much boldness, how much brass, how much shamelessness did this woman have to dis exhibit in order to make her way into the house, to make her way to Jesus' feet, to wash him with tears, wipe him with her hair, anoint him with ointment, how she had to humble herself to do this. There was no shame. There was enormous, though, boldness in what she did. Your 
bold, persistent, aggressive faith has saved you. Because if she hadn't gotten in there and made those moves, she would have never came into the presence of Jesus and never had Jesus look to her, look her in the eyes and say, your sins are forgiven you. Now what are we supposed to do with this? You know, are we supposed to sweep this aside somehow and, and develop some theological argument about faith and how that, well, it was God's faith in her and God gave her the faith and all. Okay, fine, have it your way, I guess. But it was her chutzpah that got her to the feet of Jesus, her shamelessness that got her forgiven of her sins. And Jesus summed it all up in words, your faith has saved you. The examples in the Bible are almost endless. My question, realizing that, is why is it that we are so timid about prayer and about faith when we have example after example after example in our Bible to tell us all about these things? Luke 18, verse 35. It came to pass, he was coming near to Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And he heard all this gang of people going by, and he says, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening? And they told him, he said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <coughs> and they rebuked him, said, shut up, be quiet, stay out of the way. They told him, be quiet. He's, but he cried even more. He said, now, son of David, have mercy on me. What happens to this man if he shuts up? He's not healed. You all understand that, don't you? That yet there were people there who tried to talk him out of it, tried to shut him up, told him to hush. He didn't hush. He kept yelling. He cried out. And Jesus stopped and said, bring that guy over here. When he got over him, he said, what do you want? What's all the noise about? What will you that I do with you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. What's faith? A feeling? A mood? An emotion? Or is it chutzpah? It is it persistence? Is it boldness? It was the boldness, the persistence that got this man his eyesight. Not a mood, not a feeling, nothing of that kind. Think about it. Jesus said, your bold, persistent faith has saved you. You got your eyesight. You can see. Immediately he received his sight and followed him and glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And well, I think they should. Matthew 15 and verse 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. This is a Gentile woman. <clears throat> He's gone up into this area to try to get away from everybody. Too much noise. But she said, my, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And Jesus did not answer her a word. Didn't say a thing to her. Just ignored her. Actually, women they weren't supposed to be speaking to men like this. Strange men. A strange woman should not be speaking to a strange man. It's not done. Jesus' manners may seem rude to you, but they were the norm for this time. He didn't answer. His disciples came and said, Lord, send her away. She just keeps crying. She had made her such a nuisance of herself, crying and asking and begging and pleading. The disciples kept finally said, get rid of this woman. And he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, which means she did obeisance, bowed down, and said, Lord, help me. And he said, it's not fit to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. First he ignores her. Then he insults her. This is, this is not for you. This is for, you know, the children. Your Gentiles are not in that category. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. This is in the long Bible tradition that goes all the way back to a man named Jacob who got a hold of God and got him in a double step over toehold and said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. 
They wrestled all night long. He says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. They, God touched his, the, his, his hip, put it out of joint. And he went limping for, from there on out. And he still wouldn't let him go unless he blessed me. And finally, he got the blessing. All the way today to Moses, who said, no, you're going to blot these people. If you're going to kill all these people, you might as well blot me out of the book of life. I'm not going down that road. These people would stand up to God, believe it or not. And this woman, with a lot of modesty, as far as that's concerned, and she called him Lord, said truth. I agree with you. But she continued to persist in the argument. The dogs can eat the bread that falls off the mad children's table. And listen to what he says. Oh, woman, great is your faith. What's he talking about? He's talking about her chutzpah, her boldness, her persistence, her drive, her energy, her willingness to hang in there and not give up for her daughter's sake. Sometimes we can find more chutzpah for our children than we can for ourselves. This woman certainly did. He said, great is your faith. Be it even unto you, whatever you want. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Notice his response. When he saw this kind of faith, this kind of, of persistent boldness, he said, I'll give you anything you want. Be it unto you as you will. Your faith, your boldness has done this. Now, are there any of us who think somehow that we don't have the option of being bold? That it's just either the way we are or it's the way we're not? Is this a choice we can make or is it just something we're stuck with? Do we have to sit around and wait for the gift of God that God is going to give us the gift of boldness at long last? Reading the Bible, it doesn't seem to work that way. Reading the Bible, it seems to be something that somehow you've got to reach down inside of yourself and find the persistence, the boldness, the impudence, if that's what it takes, to be persistent in going to God about the things that you want and demanding them. Too strong a word for you? It wasn't for Moses. It wasn't too strong for Jacob. It wasn't too strong for these parables that Jesus is talking about here. So, as I said, why is it then that we are so timid about prayer and about faith when we've got witness after witness after witness, the testimony of Jesus? We have examples throughout the Bible of these, exam these, these, these bold, bold approaches to God. Well, the biblical idea of faith is an active, persistent, bold, even impudent approach to God. We seem to think that faith is a passive virtue, that it's a, a set of beliefs or maybe a way of thinking, whereas in the Bible it's a way of acting. That's where possibly the difference may come in. Remember the example I gave you of the man who they called the circle drawer? My question, I guess, to you is, where will you draw your circle? 